So good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for attending um, our COVID Q&A. Um, Journey House is hosting um, with the privilege and having to partner with Freighterd and the Medical College of Wisconsin. Um, my name is Sharice Myers, and I am the Director of Community Partnerships for Journey House. And the reason why um, we are having this discussion is um, the concern. There's so much information out there about COVID and the vaccination, um, but in our community, especially that we serve and we are in the 53204 neighborhood, there's a lot of hesitancy and we just wanted an opportunity for people to share any concerns, any doubts. Um, so with us today, not only do we have representatives from Freighterd and the Medical College of Wisconsin, but our featured um, speaker and who will be answering those questions um, is Dr. Sylvia Munez Price. Um, she is a professor of clinical medicine in the Medical College of Wisconsin Division of Infectious Diseases. Um, and she will be uh, moderating or she will be doing all of the question and answers for us today. So with that, I am going to turn it over to Dr. Munez Price. Thank you for being with us today. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. So with Cherise, we have, um, discuss that we're going to have two sections, one in English and a second one in Spanish. I am going to just emphasize a few points about COVID-19 and the vaccines, which vaccines we have available, the side effects, and then we're going to go to your questions. All right, so let's just start in English. Um, and then as Sherry said, I'm a professor of medicine and I am an infectious diseases physician. All right, so something that we all know, COVID-19 is a new infection. Before early 2020, late 2019, we were not aware that it existed. So everything that we know about COVID-19 is fairly new. And we do not have years long data of how these patients do or how patients with the vaccine do. Um, what I can tell you is that the companies that develop the COVID-19 vaccine, they were luckily already working on vaccines for other coronaviruses, which are related to the coronavirus that causes COVID-19. So we're very fortunate. And that's what made it so quick and expedite the fact that we now have COVID-19 um, vaccines. And uh, we have three vaccines available that I am going to be discussing in the next couple of slides. Um, I do want to share with you and make sure that you're aware that these vaccines didn't just uh, show up out of nowhere. They have been very extensive trials performed and uh, they have shown that actually they do not only reduce the number of COVID-19 infections, but most importantly, if you get COVID-19, it's going to be mild. You're not going to need to be hospitalized and you're not gonna die from it. We're starting to understand that these vaccines also seem to reduce the load of the virus that you have. Even if you were to get infected, it reduces the amount of virus that you can shed and transmit to your neighbors, to your family members, to your loved ones, and to the community in general. So far, more than 75 million people in the US have received uh, at least one shot of the vaccine. Okay, so there are three types of, there are three vaccines that are uh, available right now in the US. Number one, the Pfizer vaccine, which is two shots, 21 days apart. It's an mRNA vaccine that basically means there's a component of, there's a genetic material that goes uh, into your body. It's, it's not going to get integrated in your body forever. 
it's just used transiently to make uh, parts of the virus that you're gonna react against you. Um, and then it is disposed, discarded. It disappears. Um, it is approved for patients who are at least 16 years of age and up. Um, it is very effective. It's over 95% effective, but most importantly, it prevents severe illness. The side effects of the Pfizer vaccine and the, all the other vaccines are very, 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 very common. If you have side effects, they're gonna be local side effects. So you get the vaccine in the arm, you're gonna get some mild tenderness, soreness. It usually appears a day or two after the shot and it lasts a day or two. That's most of the cases. And then it disappears and you're fine. Very, very few people have severe uh, problems. Actually, at the Medical College of Wisconsin and at Frederick Health, we have given over 20,000 shots and less than 100 required any kind of like anti um, allergy um, medications or anything given to them. So it is fairly safe and most people tolerate it just fine. So you have the Moderna. Moderna is also an mRNA vaccine. It's two shots in the arm, but 28 days apart. And it's given to people 18 years of up or up. Similar effectiveness as Pfizer. And then you have Johnson & Johnson that was just recently approved. So this vaccine is just one shot in the arm and that's good because you don't have to have a second shot. Um, it is not an mRNA vaccine, it's a viral vector. Basically, it's a virus that's harmless to humans and it uh, is going to give you part of, the, part of the components of the virus, not the virus, the entire virus, but just part of it so that you develop antibodies against it. It is given to people 18 years of age and up and it's 66% effective. So a little lower than Pfizer and Moderna, but good uh, nevertheless. So I just wanted to share with you the data in Wisconsin. Um, Wisconsin has vaccinated so far 2.1 million people, at least with one shot. Uh, most, of, most people in, in the state have received Pfizer or Moderna and Johnson & Johnson, given that it was just uh, approved, uh, we have so far 54,000 doses. And this is the distribution of uh, vaccination in the state. 27% um, of the people that have been vaccinated are white, 11% are black, 17% Asians. And uh, you have the breakup of uh, genders there. I don't know what's happening with Milwaukee. I mean, you see here, Milwaukee is this one or this one? This one, right? <laughs> I don't feel that bad now that I see your faces. <laughs> All right. So those are the, my main slides that I wanted to share with you. Uh, do you guys have any questions that I can answer for you about vaccines? A very common question is pregnancy. So a lot of pregnant women have received the vaccine and it seems to be safe. It has not been fully approved yet uh, because there's not enough data, uh, but it just, it seems based on, based on the data that is available that is uh, safe to give. Okay. Dr. Munez Price, um, I do have a question. Um, one of the things that I've heard from um, our community and even people that I know is the fear of the side effects. Um, and because it, it has, it's so new, 
um, that people don't know what's going to happen months or years down the line. And there's a lot of hesitancy surrounding that. Um, wh what do you say or what's your response about um, people who have that fear of side effects? Well, most side effects are mild. So let me just say that. Number two, COVID can kill you. Um, that we know, the vaccine, as far as we know, I don't know of anybody that has actually died directly due to the vaccine. Most of the side effects are mild. The same thing cannot be said about COVID. COVID can not only kill you, but if it doesn't kill you, it can leave long lasting side effects that you have well, again, COVID hasn't been with us for 10, 20 years. So it is impossible for us to know how long these patients are gonna have symptoms for, but some patients are not able to function in society. And we know of that. So COVID is like playing the Russian roulette, right? And it can make you really sick and it can kill you. With the vaccines so far, we know that the effect, that side effects are mild and are transient. So which one do you prefer? And the other, the lastly, the other issue that I will ask the viewers <laughs> to consider is that you're not only vaccinating yourself for you, you're vac getting vaccinated so that you protect your loved ones, you protect your coworkers, and you protect the society in general. In order for all of us to go back to a normal life before COVID, 80% of us, at least 80% of us need to get their vaccines. So I don't know you, Cherise, but I am dying to get back to how it was before COVID. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you for asking. Um, well, answering that. I'm, I'm definitely, you know, it, it, it's interesting. Um, because not just with COVID, but with all the other things in our world going on, um, I, I'm, I'm beginning to say instead of, I, I don't wanna necessarily go back to normal because there's a lot of things in our world that just was not normal and right. I just wanna go back to let's improve upon the way we were living before. So thank you for, um, answering that question. Um, I'm not quite sure if I, I saw a couple of other people entering um, the room and I'm not quite sure if they may need some of this translated. Um, Nora, um, do you know um, if anybody would like it translated? Yes, I know that uh, Margarita um, would, uh, Valeria, and um, I'm not sure about the last one. Um, hola, welcome. Um, perdón si diga su nombre incorrecto. I'm sorry if I butcher your name. Um, Ana, Anali, do you mm -hmm. need this translated in Spanish? ¿Necesita esta información en español? Sí, por favor, para estar más segura de que estoy escuchando correctamente. Okay, perfecto. También tenemos... Uh, a otros participantes en la línea que también van a uh, querer la información en español. So, muchas oh. gracias. Muchas gracias. Yes. Sí, gracias. So, it, there would be four people in total who would like it translated. Ok. Yo soy la doctora Muñoz Price de el Medical College of Wisconsin. Yo soy una infectóloga, uh, epidemióloga. Y bueno, me da mucho gusto estar aquí con ustedes para hablar un poquito acerca de las vacunas. Uh, como ustedes saben, COVID-19 es una enfermedad relativamente nueva. Uh, nosotros no sabíamos uh, que esta enfermedad existía hasta eh, a finales del 2019, a uh, principios del 2020. Así que todo lo que sabemos de la enfermedad es 
menos de dos años. Uh, sin embargo, ten, somos muy afortunados de que ha, han habido muchas compañías, varias compañías farmacéuticas que antes de que COVID aparezca, ellas estuvieron, estaban haciendo investigación en cómo hacer vacunas contra el coronavirus, otros tipos de coronavirus. De tal manera que cuando COVID apareció, ellos ya estuvieron listos para hacer estas vacunas. Um, Voy a pasar al siguiente slide. Uh, estas vacunas, hay tres uh, vacunas que están uh, uh, disponibles en Estados Unidos. Son vacunas que todas ellas um, han pasado un um, uh, control de efectividad y eficacia muy alta para, por el FDA, que es el, uh, la agencia de uh, a alimentos y drogas de Estados Unidos. Lo que les puedo decir es, uh, acerca de las tres uh, vacunas que están um, uh, disponibles en Estados Unidos es que las tres disminuyen marcadamente el, el número de casos severos de esta infección, disminuyen la mortalidad y disminuyen las hospitalizaciones. Más de 75 millones de personas en Estados Unidos ya han sido vacunadas contra el uh, COVID-19. Hay tres vacunas a, a, que están disponibles. La de Pfizer, que son uh, dos, uh, dos dosis uh, con 21 días, uh, separadas por 21 días. Y esta vacuna es uh, autorizada para niños de 16 años o personas mayores de 16 años. Uh, la siguiente vacuna es la vacuna moderna. Son también dos dosis separadas por 28 días y esta vacuna está aprobada para uh, niños de 19, 18 años o personas mayores. Ambas, la vacuna de Pfizer y la vacuna, vacuna moderna, tienen aproximadamente 95% de efectividad para prevenir esta infección. Luego tenemos a la vacuna de Johnson Johnson que re, re, recientemente fue aprobada. Esto es una vacuna que se da con una sola dosis uh, y es para personas de 18 años o mayores. La efectividad de la vacuna de Johnson Johnson es un poco menor, es como 66%. Sin embargo, 66% es de todas maneras un muy buen porcentaje. Um, en Wisconsin ya se han, se han dado 2.7 millones de vacunas. La gran mayoría son Pfizer y Moderna. Johnson Johnson todavía uh, no tiene muchas dosis que se han dado porque es relativamente nueva. Recién la han aprobado. Pero la gran mayoría de personas en Wisconsin ha recibido Moderna o Pfizer. Y esta es la distribución de los pacientes, de las personas en, esta, en Wisconsin uh, que han recibido la vacuna. Uh, zonas de Wisconsin que son más uh, verdes significan que han recibido mayor concentración de la vacuna. Bueno, esto es básicamente lo que quería discutir con ustedes. ¿Tienen alguna pregunta? So, Dr. Munez Price, I do have another <laughs> question, um, and um, you can definitely um, translate it um, in Spanish too. Um, but one of the other um, um, things that a lot of people are wondering um, is why is it important to get both doses of the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccine? Um, one CDC study says 80% um, effectancy um, after the first shot. Well, I read that it was around 50% effectiveness after the first shot, and then you jump to 95%. I, you know, if you were to give me an option be between less than 90% to more than 90%, I will take more than 90% any day. Any day. Uh -huh. La pregunta es, ¿por qué es que no vamos, no hacemos, no, no 
solamente hacemos una dosis de la vacuna de Pfizer o una dosis de la vacuna de Moderna cuando eh, recibir una dosis es un, más del 50% de personas van a estar protegidas. Y lo que yo respondería es que si es que uno, a uno le dan dos dosis, uno está protegido 95%, um, es 95% de protección. Y bueno, para mí, yo he visto tantos pacientes que se han muerto por COVID, tantos pacientes que han, no se han muerto, pero todavía tienen muchas complicaciones por el COVID, que si es que me dan a escoger entre menos del 80% versus 95%, cualquier día elijo el 95%. Yo he recibido mis dos dosis. Después de ambas dosis tuve dolor en, en, en el brazo, pero bueno, se pasó uh, después, apareció en la noche del día que me inocularon y habrá durado un día, dos días. Y eso es lo más común, esa es el, el, la complicación más común, es dolor o enrojecimiento en la zona de la inyección. Pero miren, todas las que están acá son mujeres. <risa> Comparado con todos los dolores que nosotros uh, hemos sufrido durante la vida, esta vacuna es nada. <risa> es nada. I'm saying, Sherry, I don't know if you understood that. that I, I A like, little. <risa> Everybody in this call are females. So compared to all the pains and suffering that we've had during our lives, the shot and the side effects are minimal. <laughs> okay. So not to put words in your mouth. So it, it, it really sounds like you're saying we definitely need to make sure we get that um, second shot, that it's, it's important for us to get that second shot. Es importante que, lo, que, lo, que nos vacunemos con todas las dosis que sean necesarias y lo más probable es que en el próximo año necesitemos una dosis más. Ya veremos. Uh, pero de nuevo, tenemos el 80% de nuestra población tiene que vacunarse para que nosotros podamos regresar a la vida que teníamos antes de covid y eso depende de cada uno de nosotros. Cada uno de nosotros forma parte de ese 80%. Y tenemos que hacerlo. Yo tengo una pregunta, doctora Silvia Muñoz. Oh, perdón, ¿alguien más tiene una pregunta? Uh, sí, yo tengo una. Um, ¿Cuál sería el efecto secundario en el que podríamos decir que podemos preocuparnos ya? Eh, ya es preocupante y debemos ir al hospital o a emergencias o por lo menos llamar al doctor cuando sentimos eh, hay algún síntoma que, que pueda alertarnos de que ya no es normal. Mire, la gran mayoría va a tener de nuevo dolor um, en el brazo, hinchazón, enrojecimiento. Hay algún porcentaje menor de personas que va a tener fiebre. La fiebre usualmente dura un día, dos días, pero si usted empieza a tener más fiebre o tiene otros problemas, uh, aparte de la fiebre o aparte del enrojecimiento e hinchazón, por ejemplo, si es que se le hincha la cara o si es que tiene problemas para respirar, que es nuevo, entonces ese es el tipo de efecto secundario que usted tendría que llamar a, a su médico o ir a consulta urgencia. Pero de nuevo, Margarita, eso no es común. La gran mayoría de personas, la gran mayoría, más del 90% de personas, tiene, si es que tiene algún, algún efecto secundario, es solamente dolor en el hombro. Esto es todo. Y las vacunas... Eh... 
las tres que se están aplicando aquí en Estados Unidos, eh, me imagino que es para todo tipo de, de uh, ¿cómo puedo decir? Como de estado de salud de las personas. No importa este, su, sus condiciones de salud. Mire, hay algunas condiciones que son raras, por ejemplo, ser trasplante o un trasplante de médula ósea. A uh, ese tipo de personas, uh, hay, 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 los médicos de esas personas tienen que tener una conversación directa con esos pacientes. Pero el resto de personas, por ejemplo, que tienen diabetes, hipertensión, uh, que tienen um, uh, obesidad, que tienen problemas mentales, que tienen uh, otros problemas crónicos que no son de inmunosupresión mayor, todas esas personas pueden ser vacunados sin problema. Gracias. Y... Una última, ¿sabe cuál es la vacuna que están administrando en el North Division High School? No. Ok. ¿Cómo podemos saber eh, cuáles son las vacunas? O hasta el momento en que, en que ya la vamos a recibir, nos pueden decir. Exacto. Cuando están, al, por ejemplo, te voy a decir uh, uh, aquí en, en la Medical College, Uh, algunas veces tienen Moderna, algunas veces tienen Pfizer y de repente ya tienen Johnson Johnson. Uh, uno no sabe cuál va a recibir. Uh, uno se entera de cuál está recibiendo cuando está mostrando el brazo. <ríe> Ese es el momento. Dr. Munez Price, um, in the chat, um, would you mind translating in English um, just what you kind of covered with Maya Brita? Ah, ok. Uh, esto, le estaba, oh, I was saying to Margarita uh, that there is no way that you can pick and choose which vaccine you want. That here in the medical college in Wisconsin, for example, we don't find out what vaccine we're going to get until we are rolling up our sleeves at the vaccination sites. And every day they have a different type of vaccine. So it's not a situation where someone can pick and choose what vaccine you get. If you are lucky enough to have a vaccine being offered to you, go ahead and get it. Go ahead and get it as soon as possible. Um, Dr. Munez Price, one of the other things that has been um, constantly discussed and talked about is um, getting the United States, not just Milwaukee, not just Wisconsin, but the United States to, I believe, is it 80% um, herd immunity? And what may happen if that's not the case? Can you expand on that? So actually, this is something that I was discussing with Margarita, and pr probably that's what you wanted me to translate too. Uh, in order for all of us to go back to our normal lives, we need to have at least 80% of the population to be immune against the virus, because that percentage of herd immunity which is basically what percentage has of the population has is protected, allows for the virus not to tra tra be transmitted within a community. Transmission stops, comes to a halt. And that's what we need in order for all of us to be able to go back to the movie theater, to be able to go back to restaurants without wearing masks, to be able to go back to our friends and barbecues and parties and clubs, et cetera. What's keeping us from doing that is the percentage of the population that is yet to be vaccinated. If we don't reach 80%, we are not able to go back to normal life. So again, 
when you are making a decision of get your vaccine or not, you are part of this community of 80%. So, so you, you don't make that decision just for yourself, but also for the entire community. I don't know if that makes sense, Cherise, tell me. Is it clear? Yes, that's very clear. And um, sometimes I wish that was maybe vocalized a little bit more um, to people because I know we keep hearing, you know, we need to get the shot, we need to get the shot, but I don't think people truly understand the reason why. And I think with so many people pushing to get the shot, then comes in that whole other component of people beginning to kind of question, doubt the government um, on why they're pushing it um, when there's, a, there's obviously a reason behind it. So that was very clear. Um, so thank you for um, clarifying that. Thank you. Sure, no problem. Um, so there is a video by the WHO um, that I, let's see if I can share it with you. Mientras que la doctora Silvia uh, Muñoz Price nos está compartiendo el video, ¿alguien más tiene preguntas? Ah, bueno, ya está aquí el video, después del video. <laughs> a ver, vamos a ver, Yo, no van a escucharlo, pero van a ver las, las imágenes y lo que voy a hacer es le voy a narrar. Miren. Imagínense que este era el virus inicial. Cuando el virus es, es, when the virus is capable of being transmitted from person to person to person, it starts mutating. It's normal. Cuando el virus inicial es uh, capaz de transmitirse de una persona a, a otras, y luego de estas personas a otras, y luego a otras, y luego a otras, lo que sucede es que el virus empieza a mutar. Y algunas veces muta en, en variantes que no son, que no son muy buenas, pero si es que, por ejemplo, esta persona es vacunada, esta persona ya no va a transmitir a más personas el virus. Y esa posibilidad de la mutación va a bajar. Si esta persona, en vez de irse a una fiesta, se queda en casa, entonces va a transmitir el virus menos. Si esta persona se lava las manos frecuentemente, también va a transmitir el virus menos. So I'm going to say it in English. So instead of all these chains of transmission and these subsequent mutations of the virus, if we are able to have some people vaccinated, for example, this ones, some people that do hand hygiene, some people that stay home when they don't feel well, then transmission helps and mutations help because if the virus is not able to be transmitted, it stops mutating. Esta persona es vacunada y ya no hay transmisión. Entonces, para es parar la transmisión del virus y prevenir nuevas variantes. Las personas tienen que vacunarse, lavarse las manos, estar lejos uno del otro y usar sus máscaras. So, to stop the spread of the virus and prevent new virant, virant, variant, <laughs> variants, uh, people need to get vaccinated, wash your hands, stay at least six feet from each other and wear a mask. And this is the only way that we are going to be able to stop 
um, the transmission and uh, the emergence of variants. Okay, I mean, I still sharing with you guys. Yes, you are. I don't know how to stop this. At Do least you want to exit the tab, the tab on top where it says tracking dementia right next to understanding. Yeah, there we go. Yeah. <laughs> so, Dr. Munez Price, I do have another question. Um, uh, someone who is not able to make the call had just texted me and said, um, is it okay to be tested for COVID after you have been vaccinated? And how is this vaccination different than other vaccinations? This was an exciting time. The first railways were introduced. The National Gallery was built. And the city. Is Sorry, uh, the video from TED Talks <laughs> was playing. I was like, "Who's talking?" <laughs> <laughs> yes, you can still get tested after after having your vaccines, um, your COVID vaccine. You know, from the side effects perspective, this vaccine is very similar to most of other vaccines. I mean, most other vaccines, when you have uh, those shots, you get soreness mm -hmm. at the site of the shot. And that's exactly what we get with this shot. So from that regards, it's very similar to other vaccines. Is, is there, well, and, and I guess to expand upon the similarities, you know, not just with the soreness, but for instance, the effectiveness, like there's a vaccine for chicken pox, there's a vaccine for the flu, there's a vaccine, um, you know, for polio. Um, how is this some, or, you know, how is this different than other vaccines or how is this different from the flu? You know, I, I know you mentioned earlier on that, you know, um, they've been testing and working on this for years because it was, I believe you said, was it other strands of the coronavirus? Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, I guess what makes this different than other vaccines? What we makes know, this different? Sherry, this vaccine is so much better and so much more effective than the flu vaccine. The flu vaccine is actually a vaccine that it, uh, many people that get the flu shot are gonna get the flu. But what prevents the flu shot, what prevents a severe disease. Now, COVID-19 is so much more effective than the flu shot, so much better. Okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> ¿Alguna otra pregunta para la doctora Muñoz Price? Analí, todo quedó claro. Sí, gracias. Todo está quedando muy claro. Okay, qué bueno. Okay. Uh, yo sí tengo una pregunta, doctora. Um, yo me, uh, eh, la semana pasada yo recibí la, segun, la segunda dosis de la vacuna. And I'll repeat my question in English as well. Um, y me siento bien, yo creo en la esencia, yo sé la importancia de ser vacunada. Um, Muchos de mis familiares también uh, están siendo vacunadas. Pero una pregunta que tengo es, um, no sé, si usted sabe, 
pero ¿cuándo va a ser seguro para que los niños puedan recibir las vacunas? Porque yo trabajo en una escuela y ya vamos a entrar a las, a las escuelas para el mes que entra y mucha gente se preocupa por las maestras, los directores las directoras y obvio son importantes verdad pero mucha gente no está mencionando cómo va a afectar a um, los estudiantes no los niños pequeños um, pero no sé si nos puede dar como una razón lógica o un timeline no um, unido como decir timeline en español um, sobre cuándo van a recibir uh, la, las vacunas los niños. Uh, my question for Dr. Munoz Price was if she knew or if she had an idea of when there would be vaccinations available to students, um, younger students from the age of uh, 18 and under, um, because a lot of times we see that even now that schools are opening, that students are are left out of that conversation. Their people are more, not that they're more worried about, because in, in overall, like teachers and principals and higher ups are very important. We want everyone to be safe, but there isn't a lot of um, uh, talk about like students and how that might affect them as well. Okay, so let me answer in English first. So the reason why the vaccines are approved for uh, people 18 or older or 16 or older, depending on what vaccine we're talking about, is because the clinical trials were done with those populations. The reason they were done with that particular population is because they're easier to do and more straightforward. And we needed data quickly. So that's why they didn't want to confound things by including including kids. So they're done, as you know, with as we spoke about, with the adult trials, the adult trials are done. And now they are doing the, the trials for kids 11 to 18 or 11 to 16. We are going to have that data by the fall. So we're hoping that by the fall, all the kids that are 11 to 18 or 16 are going to be able to get vaccinated. Younger kids, those trials are being prepared. So I think it was Moderna that is going to start a trial for six month old and older. Yes. So we will have the data, hopefully by the end of the year, beginning of next year for that very, very young population so that we can start vaccinating them too. Okay, en, en español ahora. El motivo por el cual no tenemos, uh, uh, no está indicado darles estas vacunas a niños uh, más, uh, más jóvenes de 18 años es porque los, los ensayos clínicos fueron hechos en personas que fueron 18 o mayores o 16 o mayores dependiendo de qué vacuna estamos hablando. Uh, el motivo por el cual el, eligieron a esta a población adulta es porque necesitaban hacer los ensayos clínicos bastante rápido y no querían mezclar adultos con niños. Ahora que los ensayos en, uh, clínicos en adultos han terminado, están haciendo los ensayos clínicos en niños de 11 años a 16 o 18 años. Uh, nosotros esperamos tener uh, dat datos de estos ensayos uh, más o menos en el otoño, de tal manera que en el otoño esperamos que los niños de 11 a 16 o 18 años puedan ser vacunados. Moderna está haciendo un ensayo clínico en niños de 6 meses a más, a 11 años. Entonces, esa población es Esperamos de, que, de tener datos al final del año, de este año o a principios del 2022. Así que estamos, uh, somos optimistas. Optimistic that our kids will be able to get their shots soon. Is there a fear that, um, or what's your thoughts on, um, you know, with kids heading back to school and, You know, there's a lot of schools that have been in from the start of the year, but I guess um, with our largest population of um, MPS heading back, um, 
is there a concern or should there be a concern um, with not all teachers and parents maybe getting vaccinated yet? Is there any fear or what's your thoughts on that? Well, I will say all teachers are eligible to be vaccinated at this point in Wisconsin. There should be no reason for any teacher to be working with us a shot or their shots already given. Uh, I mean, that's what's going to protect teachers from serious illness. That's going to protect teachers from dying. That's going to protect teachers from being admitted to the hospital. There is no reason why a teacher in the state of Wisconsin is not vaccinated other than a decision of his or her own. So it's not something that we can force, but it's a decision that they're making. So that's the number of one thing that they can do in order to protect themselves. Uh, the other thing is uh, that I will say is that uh, schools, the data we have so far is that they're relatively safe as long as they wear masks and try to keep themselves fairly separate from each other. But transmission doesn't seem to be uh, a major issue in the schools so far based on the data that uh, we have. Uh, will it change? Well, things change with COVID oh, fairly quickly. But what I'm gonna say again, to protect our teachers, they need to get vaccinated. Thank you, thank you. Time-wise, we're um, just we're just below the five o'clock um, hour, and I do want to be respectful of everyone's time. Um, do we have any other questions, um, concerns, or anything um, that you know we would like to bring to light right now? Tenemos más preguntas o comentarios que um, queramos comentar antes de uh, terminar la sesión? No, ya no tengo más preguntas. Solo agradecerles por esta información, por esta charla. Todo es todo muy claro. Gracias. Gracias, Margarita. Muchas gracias, Margarita. Margarita is thanking us for our time and that she enjoyed um, having this conversation in community with us. Well, thank you. Um, and I think, you know, we may be small, but we are mighty in our voices and um, putting that information out there. And hopefully we can spread this information to our friends and families and, you know, make them aware, you know, of it because, you know, they're, they're there is still so many people that just feel like this doesn't affect them, um, that it's not needed. I'll rely on everybody else to get it, but um, it was truth telling. Um, and again, thank you for that clarification, Dr. Munez Price, about what happens if we don't get to that um, herd immunity um, and, you know, um, some of the things that people didn't like before we don't want to happen so we want to get people back to work we want to get um, people back doing those things but we all have to play a part in that we're on this together mm -hmm. okay. thank you Sharice, it was a pleasure participating and uh, I hope this was helpful uh, and uh, I really enjoyed meeting you all. Uh, so thanks for inviting me. Well, thank you, Dr. Munez Price. It was a pleasure meeting you as well. And you know, I, your, your insight and your expertise and taking the time out of your busy schedule, um, I, much thanks, much thanks to you. So thank you very much. And thank you, Tiara and Allison. And I know Monique's not on, but thank you all for advocating um, for us and um, bringing in a, um, 
um, bringing in Dr. Munez Price and then um, the guests that are with us, Margarita, Anala, um, Anali, um, Daniela, um, thank you for coming on um, and being with us to, today. So thank you all. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.